announcements before we begin. Tonight is our uh, monthly singing night, <clears throat> and Brother Tyler is going to be bringing us a message also. Sister Margaret O'Dell is improving, and she's home on oxygen. She's doing better. Uh, Delbert White had a pinch nerve and not a blockage. Remember the paper, Roy Clark, and he is at home also. Mindy Bart, a friend of Elvis and Ann, has been uh, pushing herself in physical therapy and getting stronger every day. She's now able to eat, and she's been removed from the ventilator. Uh, Donnie Hendershaw is not going to have surgery. They're going to observe him and see if he gets better on his own. He's in a hospital in Elkins, West Virginia. Uh, Vida's niece, Mary Lou Usnick, has been diagnosed with brain cancer and has it has moved into her neck and upper spine. It's non operable. Paul, Paul Levin is in the Willows and he's doing better. And Ruth was able to see him in the last couple of days. Remember Janice Martin's stepdaughter's husband, Nick White, he's dealing with some issues with his lungs. Remember Jan Rowley, Bonda, and Larry. Remember Paul Facemeyer, his brother as well, and Joy Smith. Friend of Karen Metz. Also, uh, Nick Diger or Dager passed away today. Uh, if he was a, associated with the West Virginia Christian Youth Camp, I guess, for a long time. Does anyone else have any updates on the sick or anything else that needs to be announced concerning the sick or anything else? Tomorrow night at the elders and preacher meeting at six thirty. If you have anything. For the elders, uh, be sure and give it me or Mark or Elvis. Uh, the order of worship tonight is going to be uh, well, Brother Mike's going to start, Mike Parker is going to start off singing, and then it's going to be then it's going to be me, and then it's going to be Tyler, and then it's going to be Mark Paul. Good job. <laughs> I thought I was going to blow smoke out of my ears there for just a minute. Turn it over to Brother Pike. Thank right, you, smile at the picture there. <laughs> we'll turn your songs to your songbook to 249. 249. Time is the worst for the transition. No. Changing hands. 
will be taken from the Psalms, chapters, chapter 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer together. Gracious and almighty Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful day of life we have enjoyed from your merciful and loving hand. We come to you, Heavenly Father, with our prayers and petitions because we know that you are the one true living God. And you have the authority and the power to answer our prayers and the love and the mercy to keep us under your wing and provide all things for us, Heavenly Father. We're so happy, Lord, to assemble here this evening Pray that you'll be with us and bless us. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless our service to you here and increase it, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that tonight, or as we serve you here, that uh, we would spread the gospel message here in the local community, and you'll be with us, Heavenly Father, and give your word success. We pray, Lord, for the sick of our number, ask you to be with them, Lord, and be with their families and give them comfort and relief. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with those who have served our nation and pray, Heavenly Father, for our veterans and all those who have served our country. We ask you to bless them, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord, for our nation and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with us as we face challenges. We ask you, Lord, to bless our nation and ask you, Heavenly Father, to go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> The uh, Song of Invitation this evening will be page 707, if you want to mark your song books, 707. Right now, we'll turn to page 541, 541. Tarry with me, oh my Savior, for the day is passing by. Yeah. 
sing the first, second, and fourth verse, number 643. When upon thy pillows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, how still many blessings came and won by one, and you will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings came and won by one, Oh. 
230. I want to be a worker. Lately, I've been getting too ambitious, so I'm trying to make this easy. <laughs> I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work.
do first and last verse of all the songs that I have picked out tonight. <clears throat> first will be 213. Precious memory of the Will be my deep 
28. I must need go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall never get stuck of the gates of Psalms chapter 131, verse 1, how good it is to dwell in unity with our brothers, but 
science in the world and several experiments in the past have shown that we as humans, God has created us to be social. We are, as much as I and some other people I know like to say that we like to sit in our house and be left alone, we are not meant to do that. We are meant to go out and talk with one another. I want to bring an example with the Romans. The Romans needed to think of a form of punishment, and so they came up with solitary confinement. And it was, they put a man in a stone cell where no sound could escape in or out, and he was given no social interaction between a human, with another human being, just food and water for 24 hours. And when they released him after about 24 hours, they said he was, quote, a shell of what he once was. Just 24 hours without human contact, and the man practically lost his mind, and the Romans afterward deemed it a too cruel of a punishment to put on another man. The same Romans, may, might I add, who crucified Jesus, creating one of the most long, drawn-out, horrible deaths in history. And not only did I, is it just for our physical and mental health, like I just stated, it's also just better for us as people as we grow. Now, as I mentioned before, taking a drawback with science and what the Romans did, I'm going to sound like I'm going on a tangent here, but you have to stick with me here. Scientists often compare us to animals, and you always hear the comparison of man, ape to man, yada, yada, yada. If we are anything like any animal, the animal I think we were the closest to is the ant. It's small. You see one, it might bite you. It'll itch for a bit. You'll just squish it. No big deal. It'll stop hurting in a minute. But if you saw like a line of ants marching through your house, or you see that ant hill starting building in your backyard, you pick up the phone and you start calling pest control, because you know that's going to be a problem later. <laughs> one ant, no big deal. A hundred? A thousand? That's a bigger deal. Just like Christians and people. Because when we stand against sin, Satan, the sinful world that's against us, you can't do it alone. That's just impossible. And we, we stand and help one another. And one way we help one another is helping improve ourselves. And one of those ways is through rebuke. If you could turn with me to Proverbs chapter 27. I'm going to be hopping around quite a bit here. We're not sticking to any one particular book for the most part. Uh, we'll start off in verse 5 to 6. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And we can go down to 17 where it says, As iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So we see here... Now, if you're doing something wrong, and you have your, if you see your friend doing something wrong, tell him. I work as an electrician, and if I was about to grab a hot wire, my buddy next to me better tell me I'm about to grab a hot wire, otherwise I'm dead. <laughs> when you see someone doing something wrong, spiritually or in the literal sense I just said, it's better for them, no matter what, to let them know that they're doing it wrong, because they're risking themselves doing that, and you need to make sure that they're on the right path. But... Constant criticism is not the way to go either, because as much as we need to work on our weaknesses and chip those away, we also need to work on our strengths and receive some encouragement, because we all know the person who gives constant criticism, they're not exactly the most fun people to be around. <laughs> but we can read a bit about encouragement in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. Two are better than one because they had a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls. Now, obviously, don't show a raise of hands, but just think to yourself, have you ever needed help when you fall and get up to get up? I'll be honest, I've needed help before. I remember about a year back, I was coming home late from Piggly Wiggly at work, and it was, and it was winter, and we had an inch thick sheet of ice right over our driveway. I was carrying a bunch of trash in for my car and my keys. When I walked out, I slipped and fell, and my and all my stuff just slid across the ice, and I couldn't reach it. I tried to get up, but the ice was way too slippery to stand back up, and I kept on falling back down and hurting myself, and I thought, I'm smarter than this. 
So I called the house, hoping Dad would pick up, but then I had my sister pick up. Hello? Hey, hey Allie, I fell outside. Could you help me out? <sighs> Fine. And she walked up and helped me. She might have been more loving or a lot kinder than that, but that's the way I remember it at least. <laughs> she went out and helped me out. And that's more of a literal sense, but when we fall, that could be spiritually when we fall to sin and we realize we made a mistake after going too deep in, or even just for mental health sakes where a life has just been beating you down and you need someone to help you back up. Now, I've only talked about the benefits of having good brothers and friends around you and being a good brother and friend. But not only that, God commands it. Uh, we can see this in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. Uh, that's a later verse I'm going to use. There we go. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So this is so this is where God says, don't be a fair weather friend. We all know the term fair weather friend, right? Don't stick around for just the good times for your brothers in Christ. Stick around for when it's hard, too. The friend isn't, nobody's happy all the time, and no one's always going to be in a good state financially, physically, mentally, spiritually. You need to be there to help them in any way you can, because that is what we all really need. And another, and God, you know, good shot in my mind, I'm trying again. <laughs> and God finds that how we choose our brothers and our friends so important that he warns us several times. We can look at this at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Uh, yeah, right. <coughs> he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now, I have another version that says the companion of fools will be smart for it. You might think, it's funny, I didn't think a guy who hangs out with a bunch of widgets to be that smart a guy. <laughs> That's because they aren't. The fools make him feel smart, they make him feel like he's doing the right thing. You shouldn't surround yourself with, I want to be sure I'm getting the right idea across here. When you spend your time with wise men who will openly rebuke you and teach you, you yourself become wise, and then you can be that wise friend who teaches others, and the world would be better for it. But hanging around with fools who can teach you nothing, you get nothing. You essentially just have a group of yes men. I'm sure that might feel great, but how great will you come out, out of it? You can think you're great all the time, but does that mean you are? I don't think it does. That's what we call disillusion. <laughs> but we can see a more precise verse, a more popular one for this sort of uh, subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, where he says, Do not be deceived. Evil, com evil company corrupts good habits. And another version I have says corrupts good morals, which I prefer better. So not only does hanging... So hanging around the wrong group can not only make you look bad, because, like, if you went to work and you hung out with the guy who always came into work with a hangover, always had the excuse for being late, like, oh, my alarm clock didn't go off, or had to take an Adderall at work and all of that, and overall had not a great sense of humor, to put it lightly, and you hung around with that guy, first of all, that doesn't put a good image on you. And as a Christian, we're ambassadors of Christ in the church, so that doesn't put a good image on the church. And thus, and thus that gives people a different idea of what the church is, because you're hanging around someone who is corrupting good morals and habits. And also, just in a more direct sense, when you're hanging around with the guy who says, Oh, come on, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. Eventually, he will break you down. They will break you down. I remember I went to one lesson. 
This fellow wasn't right about everything from what I remember in his lesson, but he did have this one example that I really liked. And he said that you had to be careful with your company, and he took someone from the, from the class, and he had him stand up on top of a chair to try and pull him up out of sin and into Christ on top of another chair beside him. Well, guess what? He was trying to pull him up, but that guy had the lower center of gravity, so he was able to pull him right down off that chair. And he fell into sin right with him. But, when, but then, he got another chair, and he got another friend, and they both started pulling him up, and that was a lot easier. A lot of the times we use the excuse that Jesus ate with the tax collectors to sit, to say it's okay to hang out with them, I'm teaching them. But, they, but you need to be careful, and you need to choose your company selectively, because they might drag you down if you're not careful. But this does not mean to, this obviously does not mean to abandon them and to leave them out in the cold and forget they were your friend in the first place. Continue to love them, because God says to love all, first of all. And we can read more about this in Matthew chapter, nope, sorry, John chapter 15, verse 12 and 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. For all things I have heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. So this is Jesus talking to the disciples. Let's talk about this, the first two verses, get that out of the way. He said that it was a commandment to... This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's said right there. Love one another, friends, enemies alike. But I just want to go into, greater love has no one than this, than to lay one's life down for his friends. He continues to call his disciples his friends. So I just want to say, I think that is absolutely beautiful. He no longer considers them servants. He considers them close friends, who he has shared everything his father has shared with, with him. And he... And he, said, and he said, there's no greater love than the one who lays down his life for his friends, which we all know he later does during crucifixion. And I think that is utterly beautiful. But he's not just talking directly to disciples when he says, whoever, as long as you do the will of my father, you are my friends. He says this in writings for the future generations and us in a more direct form in Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. For whosoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. It is made plainly clear there. As long as we do what God says, Jesus, the most powerful being of existence, considers us a brother or a sister. <laughs> Having him on your side, considering him a brother, someone who is willing to die for you, what is he not willing to do for you? I just want to close on one last verse, a personal favorite of mine, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. I actually have a four-leaf clover here that I use to mark it because I like this verse so much. But, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So there it makes it obvious. The fellow who has a lot of friends around him, he's friendly, people like him. There's one friend who sticks closer than a brother. Ride or die, all of that, and they're willing to go through it all with you. Just a few questions I want to ask. No raise of hands, obviously, but like, just think. Do you have this friend? We all know we want this friend. Do you have this friend? Do you want to be this friend and have the responsibility that comes with being that friend? And are you that friend? 
I personally think I can answer yes to the first two. I'm not going to say I am that friend. I think I'm going to leave that for my own friends to say. But we've all seen how brothers in Christ and friends can lead us towards Christ and the straight and narrow. Perhaps so maybe you grew up in the church and maybe you're, you grew up in the church like me and you learned to be tried to learn to be that friend, or maybe you are here because you have that friend. Or maybe you're here on this journey as a Christian because you met that friend in the first place. Or maybe you're still searching for that brotherhood. Well, if you are still searching, you are free to be a brother with all of us if you would come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs> Why keep Jesus waiting? of himself on the night he was betrayed. He used the cup and the fruit from he used the fruit of the vine to represent his blood and he used the bread to represent his body which is broken on the cross of Calvary for the sins of all mankind and the blood that was shed even to the last drop to make the complete and total sacrifice that we could not make on our own behalf. Jesus did that for us. And he reigns in heaven with God and he intercedes the right hand of the Father for us, even today. Christ is risen today, tomorrow, and every day. So let's remember Jesus and what he did for us. Let's go to our Heavenly Father and ask for his blessing. Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful day of life that we've enjoyed. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all things. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless this fruit, or bless this bread, as it represents the body of Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with those who partake of it. In Jesus' name we pray. also took the cup and he asked Heavenly Father to bless that cup and we ask you Heavenly Father to bless the fruit of the vine and which represents the blood that was shed Heavenly Father we pray that it would mean everything to those who partake of it that it should we ask it all in Jesus name Amen the opportunity to lay by your store is also available uh, in the basket there in the foyer if anything else that needs to be said or announced before we close the service Let's go to our Heavenly Father and we'll have a prayer and be dismissed.
Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you once again thanking you for the opportunity to serve you. We pray, Heavenly Father, you be with us as we go through the week. We ask you, Lord, for strength. We ask you, Heavenly Father, for mercy and love. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will give it to all those that we need as well. We ask you to go with us now. In Jesus' name.